got to tell you, man. I got to tell you. I think it's been an absolutely sensational week for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, a lot of things have come out of this week that I'm pleasantly surprised and I'm loving. But as always, we start the program out with big sales. And I do think this has been a big week for them. I think this has been a really good week. I got to tell you, the more and more I hear Vic Fangio speaking and talking, the more and more I'm liking what this guy's going to bring to the football team. I think he's the best hire that the Philadelphia Eagles have had since they got Jeff Stoutland in the building. I've been saying that all week to you, and I completely believe it. I'll tell you what, we're going to make a comment here in a minute, and we're going to have a topic on Vic Fangio, believe it or not. But I think it's been a great start. I'll tell you what he's also done, Vic Fangio. I think he's taken some of the pressure off of Nick Sirianni. You got a no-shit guy in the building, and I think it's becoming contagious. Now, the question will be if the front office is going to be able to swallow that. Really, this is the first guy that has any kind of backbone in that organization since Doug Peterson. How much are you – but you know what you hire. You know what this comes down to? You know Vic Fangio and his personality, but you also knew what you were hiring with Desai. Will they have buyer's remorse for a second year in a row? Yet to be determined. I do think, again, I think that this has been a really good look. You know, I had a chance to listen to some of the players yesterday. And I had a chance to have some big sales takeaways here. And we're going to do that here in a minute. Randy Cross is going to join us. Three-time Super Bowl champion at 430 from CBS Sports. We'll get a little 49er perspective. We'll also get some NFL perspective. Philly Godfather, the legend, will join us at 530. He'll step in with us, and we'll be able to get his thoughts on what he's seen this week so far. So I think, again, it's been a great week. I think there's been energy. Um, hey, by the way, it's only two days. Let's not get crazy here. But a lot of things could have been where that football team still was looking at the past and still was looking in the rearview mirror. Can you put 2023 behind you? I think they're doing everything in their power to put that season behind them, especially the tail end of it. And I think that's a great thing. Good for them. Because I don't think they had a really good offseason on trying to dispel some of that stuff. I think they fueled a lot of it internally. There was a so there was a lot of self-inflicted wounds once again, but it seems so far this week that they have put that in the rearview mirror, and I think a lot of that's got to do with Vic Fangio. Shit, I'd like Vic Fangio to be the Eagle head football coach the way that attitude is. I think Nick Sirianni needs a little bit of that. Tell it like it is. Don't tell it like it's not. That's what you're getting with that coach. Wait till we get into some of the comments of the players and what you're hearing with this camp. Let me give you some perspective. I asked Clint Hurd a question about practicing. You know what he said? Well, last year, the first team reps they had um, in the first two practices, they had about, I don't know, maybe 39 reps. This year, they've had like 59. They're working harder. They're, they're more diligent on the little things. Okay? They're trying to correct some of the problems of a year ago. Good for them. Again, good. Good. It's the right direction. Eduardo, they're going in the right direction. Big sales. Pad's coming on next week. I kind of found it a little bit peculiar that day six is the day that they chose to put the pads on for the first time. Okay? Hey, hey Flexin, you know me. I'm not going to give you kudos for doing the right thing, but I think it's been a nice week, man. I mean, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. I am. Uh, Big Sills, good show, brother. Thank you very much. Vic is putting backups against our first team offense to see that. Love to see that. I'd love to see him 
the the young players getting in there and getting their reps. 34, big sales. Happy Friday to you. Do you think Vic can turn this D around quickly, especially with the NFC not being as good as the AFC to avoid another dive? 34, I'm going to use a Vic Fangio line in this, and that's going to come down to the players, but I think the scheme, you won't be blaming him or the accountability that's in that building. Okay? This is not going to be a Vic Fangio problem this year. This is going to be whether or not you have the right Jimmys and Joes. It always comes down to that. I don't care what company you have. Do you have the right personnel? Do you have the right guy leading you? Is that guy going to put you in a position and give you the resources to be successful? It really doesn't matter what the company is. It has no bit. You have to have the right folks to move the yardsticks in anything you do in life. You know, again, I, I tell you that back in the day, I used to get Warren Buffett on my program. And I used to ask him about investing. You know, I said, you know, when you're looking at a project and you're looking at a deal, and you find a project that you like that you want to invest in. He goes, oh, wait a minute. I don't invest in widgets. I invest in people. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, what you do is you find a company that's underachieving and you give them the resources and that's how you become successful. Nobody gives a shit about a widget. How many companies have you ever seen when the guy who founded the company, he leaves the company, that company goes to shit. Why? He doesn't have the same passion the guy did to start it. You think SpaceX would have the same type of leadership if Elon Musk left? Absolutely not. Every single time you see a great CEO to a guy who founded a company and he leaves, it's like looking at the Steinbrenners now running the Yankees. They may be George's kids, but that's not exactly George Steinbrenner. Okay. Or Dr. Jerry Buss in the Lakers. Hey, Jeannie's the daughter, but not quite Dr. Jerry Buss, if you get what I'm saying here. So you got to have the right people, man. He took Miami from 19th to 11th, despite all their injuries in the secondary. And also, I think some of the people back there didn't want to play the style of football he wanted to play. Still, is it true that Quinion Mitchell is moving up in the depth chart? I'm hearing great things about him. I hear they're moving him all over the place, too. Okay, Dan is friends with Buffett or Buffet, probably both. <laughs> Not true, this guy says. A high-level leader can build a system that can succeed with or without him. Not true. Not true. Company's only as good as the people around him, just like a head coach is only as good as the assistant coaches around him. Sign Jimmy Johnson or any coach. You don't have good assistants, no matter how good a coach you are. You'll never succeed. You Got to have good people around you. Whether it's a talk show, whether it's a football team, whether it's a business. That's like saying you could be on an island and do it all yourself. Not happening. Not happening. All right. I want to get into, and I'm going to take away. By the way, I was listening to Birds 365 this morning. And I, I I can't tell you how I see the team completely different than John McMullen. I think John does a spectacular job, and he has done a whale of a job at covering the Eagles for Jacob Sports. And I admire it, love his work, but I couldn't be more on the opposite side of how he sees things. You know, he said that somebody took out of context or somebody took the comment that when Vic said, well, he did it in college, and somebody ran with it. Well, how else would you run with it? Nobody gives a shit what he did at Georgia. That doesn't translate to the NFL. He hasn't done dick in the, he hasn't done dick in his eagle career. What he did at Georgia is irrelevant. He got him drafted. That's where it stops. Do you understand the things you did in college has no bearing on anything you'll do in the league. That's what gets you drafted. Then you got to transition into being an NFL player. All of that shit 
that went on in college has no bearing where Tim Tebow would be a star player in the NFL. Has no bearing. That's how you get here. That's where you get drafted in the first, second, or third round. That's what it ends on draft night. Do you understand that? Your college career ends on draft night because it's a new experience once you get to the NFL. All the successes that I had in college had no bearing on my failures in the NFL. Nothing. Everybody's good. It's a technique league. You don't get away with mistakes at the NFL level. You can get away with mistakes at the college level. Can't get away with mistakes in the NFL, especially against 13-year veteran guys like Jason Kelsey. You can't make a false step. You'll get blocked. You can make a false step in college and get away with it. NFL's different, even on bad teams. I did not realize. When I got to the NFL, it's a grown man league. That's right. No tricks. Very good, Prince. Absolutely true. See what Prince is saying right here? It's a grown man's league, man. No little tricks would work. Dude, Prince, I got to Green Bay. We went up there and played Green Bay. They had four wins. I said, oh, they suck. I couldn't believe it. The difference between the Packers and the 87 Bears coming off that 85 team was about five plays. They were good, too. I couldn't believe how close bad and good is in the NFL. Do you realize that? The difference between um, a 7 and 10 team and a 10, 10 and 7 team is probably 10 plays. That's how close it is, parity. There's, there's no team greater than the other team. You may have a better roster, but that doesn't make you like Jalen Hurts said this week. Talent will take you so far. Teams take you to championships. Greatest line he has said since I've been covering him. Greatest line he has said since I've been covering him. I thought Jalen Hurts had his best week this week behind the microphone. I give him an A+. Plus. I don't care what that idiot ESP says about what he's doing on the field. I gave Jalen Hurts an A plus for what he and how he handled himself this week. Fantastic. I hope he continues this trend because it looks awful good and impressive. Good for him, man. Hey, guys, please hit the like button. We appreciate it. Thank you for yesterday, too. We had a ton of likes last, um, last night. And you guys, because the show got kind of split up in the middle. Xander and I had to do a first and second part. You guys followed us over. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you very much. I don't know what college Max Crosby went to, but I know he's outstanding. A lot of guys that got drafted before him. That's right, dude. Nobody gives a shit where you, hey, look at Jason Kelsey, underdrafted, right? He's a Hall of Famer. He came to the NFL and elevated his league and elevated his game. It really doesn't matter what you hey, I don't I don't remember him at the University of Cincinnati. I remember him as an Eagle, though. By the way, before I even started covering the Eagles, I had heard of Jason Kelsey as one of the top flight guys. Rag now in Detroit was the other guy. I mean, Kevin Mawai prior to him was probably the best center that recently got inducted into the Hall of Fame. Kelsey's gonna, I think Kelsey's better than Kevin Mawai, not by a lot. But I think he's better. Okay. So Jalen had his best week, in my opinion. I want to get to some of the takeaways. The way these players are talking about this group of coaches is awesome. Look at all this. I wrote down all these comments. Prince says we do no homework. I wrote down all these comments, and I'm going to give you my opinions on it. 
All of this. I think it even goes into this. Yeah. Yeah, we even yeah, right. Okay. Big Sills camp takeaways from the mouths of the players themselves. Okay. I know, Prince. Big Sills hasn't been doing his homework for 38 years in broadcasting. Damn. I have no idea how we've made it this long either. I'll have to ask Big Joe Kraus that one. <laughs> Hi. How long has Cilio just been fooling people? 38 years. Okay. So I went back and listened to Bryce Huff. And like I said yesterday, I completely had a different takeaway than Xander and um, uh, John McMullen. I think he was telling me who he was. And by the way, whether you take it as motivation, that's up to you, not up to Vic. I didn't think Vic was motivating him. I think Vic was trying to tell him and be as transparent as possible in telling him who he is. You know how you're motivated in life when you're an NFL guy? Your salary. You get, you're a paid professional. You're not in high school or in college any longer. Do you understand that? You're, you're a professional. This is not backslaps and being told how great you are. You are gauged on your paycheck when you are a professional football player. Nothing more, nothing less. That's why players hold out, put their jobs at risk. That's why they demand more money. They're not doing that to get backslaps. You think CeeDee Lamb is holding out right now so he can have Jerry Jones tell him how great he is? Wants his money. This is professional sports. I don't need some guy blowing sunshine and rainbows at me. Tell me how to get motivated. If you're not self-motivating now, I didn't draft the right guy. I want self-motivating players. I don't need a guy to sit there with a blowhorn telling you how great or not great you are, and I hope you'll take that as constructive criticism. What the fuck are we talking about here? This is called hard-ass coaching and accountability. I'll tell you what, that's why that guy, Vic Fangio, I am a massive fan of what he's doing and how he is coming off. Because, listen, I'm, we're going to go down this list here. And, by the way, I think Kellen Moore may not as, may not, may not as be as sharp But I think he's got accountability. Speed Freak says, Sills, I don't like Vic Fangio. I was at, at a Dolphins game a long time ago, and I tried to shake his hand, and he looked straight, as, straight at me and said, who the F are you, and walked away. He's rude. Um, you, 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 after a game, went up to a coach. Did the Dolphins win or lose that game? Speed freak. I would never in a million years ever gauge what my temperament would be towards Vic Fangio if you're going up to him shaking his hand and he didn't want to talk to you after a football game. Might have been something on his mind and he has more important things to do. Okay? I would never in a million years ever say that or gauge him and his opinion because you met him after a game and he told you to fuck off. Sorry, dude. That ain't working for me. By the way, I don't give a shit if that guy wants to be my friend. I just want him to put me in a position to win some ball games. Okay? It's different, man. You, what do you want him to be? Your cousin? I mean, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> I mean, a little bit. Hey, he didn't he didn't shake my hand. Hey, fuck that. Who cares? Did he help them win? And by the way, a couple of years, he only was in Miami for one year. So I question you even saying that. Vic Fangio wasn't in Miami for more than one year. So when you say a couple of years ago, that's not true. He was only there a year ago. So let me get into um 
some of the players and how they're responding to the coaching that's going on this week. Let's start with Bryce Huff. And I like the questions that were asked to him by the Philly medium. Okay. He said, I'm working on stopping the run. Um, and I don't know where that narrative came from, but I have put decent tape together about my run stopping abilities. Hey, Bryce Huff, you live in denial, son, because that's not what the defensive coordinator thinks of you. He don't think you can play the run right now. He's saying you may. And by the way, you know what's crazy? I heard people today saying this, that he'll be ready by September 6th to stop the run. Are you fucking nuts? That's a skill set that you have to develop. Do you actually believe you're going to be a better run stopper in three weeks? Who in the world would even remotely buy into that? That you'll be a better run stopper in three weeks when you haven't been in five years. That's insane. Dude, stopping the run and being a run stopper is a skill set that takes time to develop. It takes time. It'll be fixed in three weeks by Brazil. That's an asshole statement. You've got to be kidding me. That's like saying you're going to become an efficient tackler in three weeks. Dude, it takes decades to be a great tackler. That is not true. Like Vic said yesterday, it'll be a work in progress. Um, He says he really likes Vic Fangio's coaching style. Um, he was asked about the question that I brought to Xander and everyone. What about the fact that you're going from 450 snaps to 850 snaps? Have you done any more conditioning to get yourself ready for that? And he said this, well, I've always prepared for 850 snaps. The difference is you have never played over 450 snaps. Now we're going to have to see if you can hang up and hang on to the war of attrition. You understand that. He has only conditioned his body as a football player to be a backup player with the amount of reps that he's got. Last year was the highest volume of reps he's ever gotten. And what was the most important thing about his jet time and him being with the Jets? They let him walk away. They didn't trade him. They just let him walk out the building. Because they thought he's not good enough on what they need when it comes to be a three-down lineman. The Jets quit on him. Now, does that mean the Jets are right? No. No. But the Jets don't believe he can be a three-down defensive player. Or they would never have not traded him. Even Howie Roseman traded Jalen Rager. I mean, if there's some value to you, if there's some value to you, you're going to trade it. Right? You're going to trade it. So, I mean, the Jets quit on him. That's That doesn't necessarily mean the Jets are right. I'm not saying that. Went to see um, Huff's highlights from last year. Okay, he was all right, I guess. And, and that, again, I didn't see him as an impact player last year. But I didn't see Hassan Reddick as an impact player when he was in Arizona and Carolina. But when he got to Philadelphia, he became an impact player. And... I'm not suggesting to you that Vic Fangio is a better coach than Robert Sala. I think they're both very talented defensive guys. It's going to be interesting to see. Let me let me finish here. 
He loves working with Josh Sweat. Says you have a guy here that knows how to prepare himself for an NFL season. That's a good thing. Okay. I'd love some of the comments from these players. Not sure if you have talked about this, but what are your thoughts on Vic's comments on using his own analytics? I totally love it. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to it. I totally love that. Vic doesn't trust people's analytics on what they're going to give to him. I, I we're, we're totally going to get, hey, 77, I got a topic ex expressively on that. How about this one? I think this is a really good foundation piece for this defense. Anytime you're working against Jordan Mulata and Lane Johnson, you're going to have talented people to work against, and it's going to make you each and every single time when you go in to a football game and you're working with the absolute best, okay? And they're working with the absolute best. And that, to me, in my opinion, that is gold because he understands. You're not going to – how many times do you really think you're going to line up against Lane Johnson? Or how many times are you going to line up against a guy like Jordan Mulata in an NFL season? Nobody has two good offensive tackles. Makes you better. I really believe will be the, I really believe will be the barometer of Sirianni and all the coaching staffs moving forward. When Vic said that Howie's blood was boiling. Oh, I I hey, I promise you guys we're going to get to a topic here that's going to challenge what some of you guys are thinking already and I know what some of the people are thinking, I even heard John McMullen say it, and I agree. He also said this about Nolan Smith. He's preparing, he's working hard, but you know what you didn't hear? He's talented. Because that's a work in progress. Here's what I got and I take away from Bryce Huff talking to the media for the first time with the Eagle people. And so the Eagle fans can hear him. I think he's delusional a little bit on his run stopping ability because he's not very good. And I also think that anybody who thinks that that's going to be resolved by September 6th is high. It takes you a long time. Get this. I heard a comment that Jordan Davis was told because Vic was screaming at him, get your ass down, get your hips down, bend over more. I know now the problem with Jordan Davis. Do you want me to tell you as before I move on here? You know what the problem with Jordan Davis is? How many people want to hear the problem with Jordan Davis? When I heard this comment, and I heard D Devin White pointed this out. Do you, you guys want to hear what I think the problem is? There you go, Kyle. Lazy fundamentals. But get this. Leverage, twist, perfect. All of you are correct. He is so talented. He thinks he's in college still. And he can get away with that. And Vic's screaming at him. Get your ass down. Play with leverage. This is a league you can't do that with. You're not playing Vandermilk. You're not playing Kentucky. Get your hips in the right position. It's so true. Dude, I learned so much from a defensive uh, coach named Lamar Leachman. He goes, you're so strong and you're so fast, Cilio. You know what your problem is? You're lazy. And I'm like, lazy? I'm not fucking lazy. And he goes, you're lazy on technique. You think Kevin Glover or any of these other centers that you're going to be able to do that shit to? If you get high, no matter how good you are, they're going to drive you off the ball because they got better technique and better footwork than you. Oh, yeah. That guy's got to work on his fundamentals more. But you've got Clint Hurt. You've got Clint Hurt. And you've got Vic Fangio. Boy, I'll tell you what. 
This might be the best coaching staff Nick Sirianni's ever had so far, including Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon. This might be your best staff that you've had since the Super Bowl 17 year. You've seen the problem since day one on his leverage. He's way off because his ass always is way too high. No ditty. Marshall, I've said that you're right since day one. Get your ass down in a proper position. You, if Jordan Davis just takes the little things that Vic and Clint are teaching him, he'll be all pro. He'll be all pro. And all the things you want with Jordan Davis will come true. Makes me think that as much as I hate to say this, Tracy Rocker didn't do a very good job developing him. Okay? Tracy did not do a good enough job. And get this, Tracy had him at Georgia. Okay? So, I mean, I love Tracy Rocker. I, you know I do. He's one of my teammates. But, um, yeah. So let's go to Cam Jurgens now. This was really good. Here's some of my takeaways with Cam. He and Jalen right now are working together on pass protection. He, he said that this is going to be a joint progress in how they're going forward. And this is going to be a joint effort between the two of them to pick up because of what Jason Kelsey brought to the table for years. This is part of the problem that you're going to face this year. The things that Jason Kelsey did were taken for granted for years. Anytime you have to have two people covering for a guy and his job responsibilities shows you that this guy's value was more than just blocking. So this is going to be a work in progress, according to Cam Jurgens. I'm loving this, though. guys. They're communicating. They want to get better. I feel better about your Philadelphia Eagles going into this year than I ever did one second last year. And you know me. I'm as critical as anybody. I feel better about your football team going into training camp right now than I did at any time last year, including the offseason, including the minicamp OTAs, even when you were 10-1 and one or whatever the hell the record was. I feel 10 times better right now, 10 times better right now about your football team going into this year than I did any time a season ago. Hertz is definitely taking more of a role in protection. And this is Cam Jurgens. He said he's definitely taking more of a role in it. Great. Maybe it'll help them identify the blitzing more because they're going to blitz them early. Okay, they're going to blitz them. And Cam says, you know, work in progress, but Jalen's taking also some of the responsibilities of pass protection. Boy, I'll tell you something. You are without a doubt asking an awful lot of Jalen Hurts this year. Man. And do I think he has the mental capacity to absorb all this and make it happen? I do. Then it's going to be applying it. First, you have to absorb it. You have to process it. Then you have to apply it. Okay? Here's something that they said they're working on as an entire offensive line. This is Cam Jurgens. We're working on communication up and down the line. And um, it's really working well. That's why we got out to a nice start this week so far. Because we've been working on communicating with one another going up and down the line. And I'm like, and this is gold. Dude, you're giving me you're giving me a Woody. This is great. 
This is the first sign I'm hearing things with these coordinators that are making sense that I'm going to go, whoa. Whoa. Um. A lot of us, get this, this is what he addressed too, Cam Jurgens. All of us will handle blitz calls this year differently. We're handling a little bit differently this year because of all the communication. And by the way, this is what he said on why the meltdown happened and why they struggled with blitzes and why they struggled with things later in the year. You know what he said? We didn't have players in the right position. That's Jeff Stoutland, too. That's Jeff Stoutland. Also, we didn't have players in the right position last year. Okay? We we didn't have them in the right position. And we were a little confused. And we didn't have the proper answers. Holy shit, accountability. He's covering for owner and front office. How come the coordinators speak clearly and little Nick just goes on tangents? Hey, senor, let's do this. Let Nick do that shit. Stay out of the way. If he wants to be whatever he wants to be, just get out of the way of Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio. And if I'm hearing this from the players, it gets even better as I go down the list here. This is going to get even better what these guys are saying. Um. All of us are going to handle the blitz, as he said. Okay, we, we, we're, we're all learning it, including Landon. I like what I heard from Cam Jurgens. Now, let's get to Dallas Goddard. This was just tons of content out of Dallas Goddard. Tons of content. Um. Offense is doing well, he said. Really enjoys what they're doing and in the installments. You know what he said, too, when asked the question about Vic Fangio? He goes, do you know what makes that and what they're doing so good? It's multiple fronts. And multiple disguises. That's one of the top three players paid at tight end saying that Vic is going to be moving people around and having knowledge is going to be instrumental on that side of the ball. He says they're using multiple fronts and multiple disguises. You see... Don't ever listen to a reporter. Go back and listen to the interviews of the players because you know what happens? It gets lost in trans in translation on what the reporter thinks the player's saying. Don't listen to those guys. Listen to the players. Worst thing ever happened to beat writers with social media. Because I don't need you. I'm just going to go to the player interviews. And I'm going to hear what he's saying. I don't want to hear your interpretation of what you think he said. I know what I heard. I know how I applied it as a player. I know how other great players that played next to me applied it. I don't give a shit what a reporter and his thoughts are on it. I don't really care. How would you know? How would you possibly know? What? Because you write about it? Um, ask the question. This is Dallas Goddard. He goes, some of the things that we're doing right now is all terminology. And we have to understand terminology a little bit different. So, there is a new terminology sheet on the offensive side of the ball. He goes, something that was said something a year ago is a little bit different today in a nuance 
on what Kellen wants. So that's something that we're still work in progress. I found that to be a little troubling because if I'm the coordinator, I'm not going to make their job harder. I'm going to make their job easier. I would like to make the plays fit to what they know. It yet change the plays, but I don't know how you could do that at the same time. So I think there's got to be a, a little bit of give and take on that. So, yeah, I really loved it. I mean, there's so many great things going on here in camp for the Eagles. This is, I mean, fantastic. Here's something that you're going to be, and you tell me how you take this. Jake from Hawaii. Thank you, brother. Been to Maui myself a few times. How about this one? Yes. This is Dallas Goddard saying this. There's going to be more progression reading, and there's more progression in the route trees, which means, you know, first, second, third. He's going to have to. So get this. Hertz is going to have to work on line protection and progression reading. This is all being added. These are things he struggles on. Something to keep an eye on. Goddard said it's more progression reading. That's going to mean less targets for AJ. How will he handle that? Last year, that was the primary receiver. 38% or 37% of the targets went to him. That's not going to work in a Kellamore offense here. Not saying he's not going to get his targets because CD always got his targets in that offense, but they're moving him around. And you're going to see more people being moved around. Okay. So there's more progression reading. Motion said there's a ton of it. Um, and he's really digging it. Now, let me tell you a little bit here. He goes like this. He said, and this is Dallas Goddard talking. You should see the motion that Kellen has. His route trees that he has in his pass routes, they're constantly moving the linebacker around. And they're constantly confusing the linebacker. Fantastic. If Hertz is going to, if you're, you're, that's helping the quarterback. That's helping the quarterback in learning his progressions. Fantastic. This is all good. This is the first week what they're doing. Hey, you know me. I don't throw sunshine and rainbows at anybody. But these are the players talking. Also, you remember to all your elite, even though, like I said, since being married Philly, Five divisions to our three. James, I know. Hurt sucked at checkdowns and progression panic and either ran or dumped it out. Let me tell you something, man. This you're listening to the players here again. Um, he loves going against CJ Gardner Johnson. Gardner Johnson's talked shit to him, and they're con man. What what you're getting is like competition between the great players and the young players this is this is good man this is good Goddard playing against Gardner Johnson hey how about this too man you know what one of the great camp watches and must watch tv can anybody and i know you guys over at novacare i know you guys watch the show can you please do me a favor when you guys go to pads can I watch can I watch Jalen Carter um going against Micaiah Becton? Can I can I watch that? Because I want to see that. And I, I want to see Jalen Carter getting Tyler Steen better. I want to watch that. Tyler Steen cannot have any more of a greater player to improve his game on than that guy. You want an old pro right guard? You've got an all-pro defensive tackle playing against him. He's going to whip his ass into shape or off the team. Perfect. Because if you can stop Jalen Carter, you're going to have a starting role for 10 years. That's, hey, 
You beat Jalen Carter, you'll beat nine out of ten defensive tackles in the NFL on a Sunday basis. What more can you ask for? Even if you beat him 50% of the time, even if you only win 30% of the time, you're going to start in this league. Same thing with going against A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith. That, you, hey, talent makes other players more talented. Um, health, obviously, will be an issue for Dallas, for Dallas Goddard. He said, look, I'd love to have 100 catches and 1,000 yards, of course, but this is going to come down to my health as it always is. Ben, hey, sales Kellen might be simplifying and reforming the whole thing like that guy in Seattle is on defense. Um, it seems to me, though, they're asking him to do a lot. Hurts. Help in protection and also progression reading. That's, a, that's, a, that's more than they asked him to do a year ago. Okay? That's more. By the way, he likes – Calcaterra, by the way, the guy that they got, that that free agent guy, is not in the landscape of being the second team tight end. Okay? Grant Calcaterra's got that job locked up. Unless something catastrophic happens. And they're even talking about going to two tight end set. Okay. Here we go. It's good. Two tight end set. All right. Now, let's get to Devin White. He said some great shit. Now, Devin White has moved on from his failure in Tampa. I don't know, and I said it again yesterday. I don't know what kind of success Devin White is going to have in Philadelphia. He's got a great attitude. He wants to right the ship. He wants to be a leader on the football team. He wants to do all the right things, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be translated on the field and turn into production. So we still have to wait and see. 11-17 goes, failure. He has a ring, really. Um, let's see. So does Jalen Rager. Or does he? Where'd you get rid of him? No, he doesn't have a ring. Let's see who has a ring. I'm trying to think of a stiff that has a ring. Um, hmm. Pick any stiff that's on a roster, 53, man. Because the last three years, he's been a stiff. Um, don't talk to me about Devin White being a good ball player. He was a good player year two. He said that, look, accountability. By the way, I'm giving him the benefit here a little bit. He said versatility in a Vic Fangio defense is essential. Um, it's great working against the Eagle offense. It's making us better. That Juju Smith-Schuster has a ring. <laughs> There's your stiff. And by the way, he also helped beat the Eagles. Vic has put some blitzes in for him. Is Vic going to blitz him from the LB position? Something he's not known to do? That's, a, that's the first I've heard that. So they're going to put some installments in for Devin White to use some of his ability and his athleticism. Okay. He's 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 put the pass behind him. Here's something that you got to look at on what they're doing over there on that side of the ball that is so Promising for the Philadelphia Eagle defense. Multiple coverages. Do you understand what multiple coverages are? That means one side of the football is going to give you zone, maybe, and the other side is going to give you man. 
and they're going to keep flipping that stuff around. Do you know how confusing that is for everybody? If you're not on the same page, don't be shocked if you see the Packers with a wide open guy in that opener have a wide open touchdown because if you're not on the same page and you don't have experience in the secondary, they're going to eat your ass alive. So you need to get as much practice time as possible in, and you need to have a lot of communicating. He said that Vic calls you out too. He said he'll call your ass out, team meeting, in practice, in the hallway. He'll call you by name. He doesn't care. He, he just doesn't care. He has no filter. Hey, that sucked. Needs to be better. Now, on the other hand, you know how you coach? If you're going to use that tone, you still have to come back and go, that's a fantastic job. It can't be one-sided. You can't have a coach that's constantly just hammering you. You have to have the guy on the other side that also says, that's what I'm looking for. That's the kind of – this guy is the best defensive coordinator that you have had in your building since Jim Johnson because that's the kind of shit that gets you in the right position and in the right mind frame, and you know where you stand with him at all times. There's nothing going to be sneaky or subversive. You're going to know where you stand in that huddle and on that depth chart. You don't need a depth chart in Philly now in defense. He, he, you're going to know by how he looks at you and how he plays you and who plays and who doesn't. That's going to be a problem. I think Vic Fangio is going to be a problem. I'll explain here in a minute. Um. He said this. He calls out Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis all the time. Get your ass down. Hey, hustle to the ball. Let's go. What are we doing here? He said playing with guys like that, and he goes, those are his boys because, you know, those SEC guys are stick as thieves. Most of the time they were recruited to the same schools. Most of the time that you've gone to, you've gone to all-star games together. You were on – um, all-star teams together when you're in the SEC. That's a good thing. That SEC blood is is real. And they're very proud to come out of that conference and represent that conference. And you can hear it in his voice. You know, he goes, hey, I went to LSU. Those other guys, of course, are Georgia guys. He said we used to talk even when I was in Tampa, that we'd get on the phone with one another and just start talking about what's going on. That's, that's the kind of communication and relationship that you have with one another. I think that's a great thing. You already have a built-in camaraderie when you're sitting there and you're already in your own huddle or you're in your own locker room, and you know one another's weaknesses, strengths. You know what one guy can be pushed, one guy can't. I think it's good, man. I do. I think it's good. I think, again, listening to these players talk, Motion. There's a new, I think there's a new vibe in the building. I really do think that there was a, you know what? And I'm not going to make James Jones. You're probably going to hate this, but I'm really going to, I'm going to kind of give a little bit of a hall pass here. That team was worn out from that Super Bowl run. Mentally. In those first 10, 11 games, they were winning on talent. And that's why Jalen told you, talent will take you so far. The team fell apart in the second half. You won 11 games on talent. Talent will only take you so far. Good teams take you to championships. I think that's exactly what he's saying to you about that 2023 season. Okay? Yes, sir. Good for you. We get to the second topic. This won't be as nice. And again, when I listen to players talking, 
And get this, do you understand when someone disagrees with me on my take on what a player says and somebody tries to give you their opinion on what they thought that player says? Both are right. The only difference with me is is I played next to people that have been talked to by these coaches like this. And I've been talked to like this. I know what they're saying. I know what they're expecting. I don't need to have a translator. I don't need a translator. Okay? I don't. Buddy Ryan used to get in Jerome Brown's ass every fucking day. Get your rascal. He used to destroy Mike Singletary. You're supposed to take what Buddy said to Mike Singletary and not apply it, that he was killing him. You got to always remember where he's coming from, though. He killed him. Mike Singletary said, I didn't think I could ever play for the guy. He goes, I never thought I could play for him. He used to kill me, man, for about three weeks, man. I got back to my locker. This is Singletary telling me the story. He goes, buddy's just killing me, man. Film room. Singletary, what the fuck are you doing? Where? Get your head out of your ass. What the hell is this? That sucks. He says one day, man, he's after practice on two a days up there in Dearborn. He's like, you know, he puts he puts his head down. He goes, I can't play for this guy. Buddy Ryan comes over to him. He goes, hey, 50, if you listen to me, you'll be in Canton. Walks away. He goes like this. He goes right from there on. I knew it. I could play in this league. Okay? Hey, 50, you listen to me. You'll be in Canton. Not just a good player. You'll be in Canton. You hear me, 50? Hey, 50, you listen to me. You'll be in Canton. All the shit that he said negative to him, Mike Singletary forgot he said. Because that he never forgot. Killed him. Three weeks. He goes, I can't play for this guy. This guy, I, I, I can't play in the NFL. Hey, 50, if you listen to me, you'll go to you'll go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You'll go to Canton. That's coaching. Build them up. Tear them down. Tear them down, build them up. I can't tell you how that used to be a theme with my coach, Jimmy Johnson. Tear us a new one, Monday to Tuesday. Build us up Wednesday to Saturday. It was a theme. You could always kind of get your ass handed to you on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday to Saturday, build your ass up. Greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, my God, I've never seen anything. <laughs> First two days of the week. What the hell is this? We beat a team by 46 points, and they're still kicking your ass. That's coaching. So when I hear something or I read something and I look at a depth chart or what have you, I look at it completely different. When I look at mannerisms and how people talk about other players, there, there's a reason because coaches talk like that. Coaches talk by familiarity. Always remember, you want to know who a coach has his mind on? Ask this question. I wish I could sit there at Novacare and ask Nick Sirianni one question. At the number three wide receiver position, what guys do you like? And if he names them in a, what order, that's the order that the organization's looking at them in. Some other guy, a reporter, would look at that as being nothing. To me, how you put him in a a category and how you identify him. I know who he looks at as a depth chart. He'll look at Paris Campbell, the next guy, then the third guy. And that's how it will be because he's on the topic of mind. Who's the backup role player going to be for the defensive tackles. First guy he names will be the rotation guy. Who's going to be, if one of the receivers happens to get nicked up Devonte Smith or AJ Brown, who's the guy going in? First guy he names, we have a collection of guys. Or maybe that guy's not even on the team yet. Okay? I mean, when you hear coaches talking, Tom Landry did it. 
Tom Landry did that. I played for Tom Landry and for Jimmy Johnson. Lamar Leachman, one of the greatest defensive line coaches of all time. Okay? I, I played for him. I played for Ray Perkins, a guy who drafted Lawrence Taylor, Bill Sims, and Carl Banks. I know how these coaches talk. <laughs> it's nothing friendly. Now, it's different today. It is. Let's get to this topic here. Um, I think Xander's on the road today, so I don't think we're going to be able to get him when it comes to um, not sure if we're going to be able to get him because he's on the road doing some work today. So he's been killing it, by the way, on Birds 365. Those guys, him and John, I think they got to do a show tomorrow too. So they're going to do like a 30-minute show tomorrow because I was listening a little bit. So if not, don't worry. Get um, Our friend uh, Randy Cross will be with us from CBS Sports at 4.30. And also, we will have Philly Godfather on with us. That'll be at 5.30. Um, Wilbur was playing at the same time as LT. He didn't get the credit. He was a monster. I'll tell you this. Wilbur Marshall was one of the greatest hitters in the history of pro football. And Wilbur Marshall was a sensational football player. He's a Florida Gator. And I'll tell you, Dexter, a small story. We went up there in Gainesville and we played him. And by the way, I think he got more accolades than what LT did at Carolina because he was at Florida. But his teams were on probation and his teams were great. Let me tell you this. So we're freshmen going up there. We're early in our careers at Miami. And we go up there and they beat the piss out of us. We still went on to win the national title. They beat us 28 to three. It's the biggest ass kicking in the history of Miami and UM series. We used to play it every year, first game of the year. They crushed us. We went on to win 11 games in a row, win the national title. And Wilbur Marshall hit Alonzo Highsmith. Highsmith comes walking off the field. And I heard Wilbur saying something. He's from Satellite Beach. He was a tremendous athlete. Tremendous. Scored 25 points a game in, in high school as a basketball player. Could have did anything he wanted. He was so fucking amazing. And he was pointing down like this. And Highsmith comes walking off the field, and I go, what did he tell you? He goes, he told me next time he saw me, he was going to kill me. And I, and I went like this. He did? And he goes, I go, what would you tell him? He goes, I told him I believed him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, Dexter, uh, he, he goes, I told him I believed him. <laughs> Wilbur Marshall is a legendary Floridian. He is a legendary Florida Gator and a legendary football player in that state. And, yes, he was spectacular. Hey, do me a favor. Google the Wilbur Marshall hit, I think, on Eric Hipple. Okay? Google that hit. All you see is this. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a hockey hit. Like Lindros when he got laid out by Scott Stevens. Dude, Wilbur Marshall, ultimate badass. No question. And he was one of Buddy's guys. So you had that guy on that defense, and you had Mike Singletary, and you had um, Plank and Gary Fensick, and, and the rest of them guys. Mongo now going into the Hall of Fame. Dan Hampton, those guys ate, and they ate. That was the best defense I've ever – well, that and Gang Green, two best defenses I've ever seen, legendary defenses. Just – it's a damn shame that Gang Green didn't get the respect, but Gang Green and 85 Bears are right there. All right. How many people believe that Vic Fangio is going to be a problem on the Philadelphia Eagles? I just gave him his flowers, too. Is Vic Fangio going to be a problem for Eagle management? Is he going to be a problem for Eagle management? I heard John McMullen say something excellent today. 
Not at all. They respect him. Um, Haas, I'll try to I'll try to change your point of view, Twiz. Sam Mills is a great player. Vic takes no BS. No, we need accountability from players. Okay. How about accountability from Howie? You think Howie's going to take accountability? Mike, it's one thing to say the players have to have accountability. Do you think Howie will take accountability? Why would he be? Nah. Okay. Let's find out. And let's see. Tills, they hired him for a reason. They also hired Brian Johnson and Sean Desai for a reason. Those reasons were wrong. Don't make that sound like a certainty. Am I right when I say that? Okay, well, here. Here's my take on why he'll be a problem. Why do you think James Bradbury's on the team? I, I know now, listening to Devin White, James Bradbury might not be the most talented player versus these young new studs you have. But he's more intellectual because he'll know where to line up versus these other players who've never been in multiple schemes or NFL defense. Just because you're the more talented player doesn't mean you're going to start over James Bradbury. If James Bradbury knows what he's doing, he's going to start. I don't think the Eagles want him to start at all. I agree with John. I don't no way do they want him to start. But Vic's not putting people back there that don't have proper communication skills with multiple fronts and multiple sets in the secondary. And you guys are running around with your head up your ass and you don't know and you haven't communicated in an NFL huddle in your entire life. And you think you're going to put guys from Toledo or Iowa or what have you. And I completely disagree with John in saying that it's only three weeks. Three weeks of training camp is a fucking three months of training camp and how that applies to you and your knowledge of what they're installing and some of the reps you're missing. It is a monster miss. Nothing to do with his, his, his ability. It has everything to do with his accountability when he's in the huddle. If you're not on the field practicing it, how can you apply it? Okay? That's a monster miss. It's, it's, it's a shame. But what I'm saying is, here's James Bradbury. The Eagles do not want that guy on the team. They want to cut him. They could save more money cutting him and only have 4-3 against the cap. What do you think, Lori? Let me ask you something here. Just as a normal common sense, do you think the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles would rather have 4.3 of a cap hit versus the $25 million that you have in available money? Cost them nothing, really. Or do you think he wants to pay James Bradbury $12 million in a base sal or in a salary this year? How does that common sense make any sense? You really think the owner wants to stroke him a $12 million check this year? Or do you think he'd rather take the cap hit? Use your common sense. It costs Jeffrey Lurie nothing. He's got $25 million in available funds and cap space. Cost him nothing. Nothing. And yet you guys are telling me, well, he'd rather, you know, he'd rather pay $12 million to the corner who last year was graded as one of the worst corners in the league. What? That doesn't make sense. Same cap hit now as it would be in three weeks. Why would you have? Hey, Dexter, you know there are roster bonuses and incentives that are built into your contract 
during the preseason exhibition season and leading you up to a roster bonus when it comes to the active roster. 95% of the NFL players have a roster bonus for making the active day roster. I had one for 10 grand. So when you got your base pay, and and I'm just going to, I'll tell you what I made. My base pay was 10 grand um, for 16 games in 1987. When I was on the active roster, I got an additional 10. If I played 40% of the plays in that game, I got an additional three. And if I stacks or what have you, I could make 20 grand in one game. Going to pay him regardless, so have him as a backup in case of injuries. How about this, James? I think he's, I, there's a chance he may start. You know why? Because he may be the only guy back there that knows what to do. Until the other guys get acclimated and process the information. Dude, you're hearing Devin White say, and even Dallas Goddard, these defenses that Vic Fangio is throwing at you are complex defenses, and you have multiple front looks. And there is no question. By the way, If you got James Bradbury on the second team and you're working him in the first team and first and second team and you're getting him reps, if you didn't have, let me tell you what they do in training camp, folks. When they cut you, you don't get reps. You, you, your scout team, you don't get reps with first and second team. That means they're preparing you. When you're in training camp, And the amount of limited training camp that you get today, if you're getting any kind of reps, they're preparing you for the upcoming season. Why would you give reps to a guy who's not going to be on the fucking football team? You wouldn't. Oh, I believe that. Hey, Ronald, I believe they're looking at this right now going, Does it make sense for Justin Simmons to be dropped in here now because we might need a little more success? And by the way, Justin Simmons has worked with Vic Fangio and knows his style and knows the multiple coverages that he has and likes to run. Does it make sense for us to bring him in? They may have even offered him a contract, but what did Justin Simmons' people say? They're looking at the best available deal right now. He's 31. He's not looking to win a Super Bowl. He's looking at the best financial deal right now. That's what he's looking at. You think Justin Simmons is looking for a Super Bowl ring? Fuck that. He's 31, 32 years old. This guy's looking. He made second team all pro last year. This guy's looking for a bag of money. He's not looking for. um, And and by the way, then you got to also worry about, does the guy come in, pull a Deshaun Jackson? and Does he end up pulling a hamstring and wanting to get paid for the remainder of the year and get an accredited year? That's organizations will look at that as well. Okay. So again, I mean, do do I think here and to go back? Here's here's another thing. So what if Howie Roseman goes like this? Howie's talking at the press conference with Nick Sirianni and how much faith he has in the Kobe Dean. And here's Vic Fangio going, "Well, he was good in college." I know John doesn't think that's nothing. That's kind of it's kind of a backhanded slap. Who cares? He knows better than that, Vic. Nobody talks about their college days in the NFL. Oh, nobody cares what you did in college. It seems, what do you think this is a league of Al Bundy's? You should have seen me, man, at Polk High. I ran for five touchdowns against Bloomington North. <laughs> what are you, crazy? So when Vic benches that kid, they ask him why he's not in the game. Vic's going to go. He's not good enough, and he can't stay healthy. He's not very good at covering tight ends, which I've said since day one. He's not very good at it. And and then they're going to go, well, and then there's Howie Roseman have to have accountability for a shitty draft pick. What if that, again, What if Bryce Huff can't play the run? There's accountability for Howie. 
how he's got accountability on two big positions right now. You ready? If Nicobe can play and if Huff's the guy. And Vic's going to make that call. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you don't think that's going to be a problem. Why aren't you playing him? He's not good enough. Since when does Howie Roseman take accountability? Well, he kind of did in the presser. I want to be fair. Said I didn't put enough good players in the secondary back there last year. He did say that. I got to be fair there with that. I think they need to bring Simmons just to reassure there's a QB on D that Fangio trust. I think, Roland, it's more about money with him. Okay? I do. Huff versus the run on tape. I saw it. I, I think the guy's delusional. I think he's delusional. Why did you keep asking why is James Bradbury still on the team after June 1st? Now I know why. Vic wanted him. I know why now. I I, I completely know why now, senor. How he doesn't want him on the team. There's no way you want that guy on your team. You want the younger players to get reps. You drafted these guys. James Bradbury takes reps away from Kaylee Ringo and some of the rest of the guys that are on your football team. Told you depth? No, no, no. He's going to start. Well, you wait. Let me ask you. Can you? Hey. Senor, let's let's take you. Senor, let's 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 stick with you here. If you were Vic Fangio on July 26, who would you start in a football game? Quinion Mitchell or James Bradbury? Who do you think Vic Fangio would be more comfortable starting at corner? Versus Justin Jefferson. Or oh, yeah, no, let's do this. Do a realism. The Packers. Senor goes like this, the guy that will get the job right. See what he said right there, this last one here? Look at this right here. That's a perfect statement. The guy that will do the, the job right. Not who the better athlete is. Not who the better player is. That right there. The guy who will do the job right. Correct. That's the point. That's why he's on the team. He's on the team because Cooper DeGene's hurt. And Vic doesn't trust those young kids yet. You Got to see him in competition. Now you know why they got the guy. Everybody in Philadelphia was 99.9% .9 sure that Howie Roseman was going to cut James Bradbury. No way. They were never at any time going to cut him because Vic's influence said, I need that guy so that the young guys can watch him play the position. Dude, when you watch a guy who knows what he's doing and you're a younger player, you eyeball these guys. And you're, uh, look, you're Keely Ringo or you're Isaiah Rogers or you're some of these guys and you're watching James Bradbury play in a Vic Fangio defense. And by the way, I think Vic probably thinks he could have a bounce back year like 22 playing in that type of system that they have with the multiple coverages. You hear what Dallas Goddard said? The defense looks like it did in 22. Well, if that's the case, Bradbury's part of that. He was second team all pro that year. Okay. Right? Bradbury did a horrible job last year, but Bradbury had the most snaps on defense, so he's worn out. Look at this. And, and, and Senor, I'm not ripping you here. Bradbury did a horrible job last year. Name me one guy on defense that did a great job last year. Can you name me one? Can you name me one guy last year, Senor, that did a great job last year or who was decent? Hassan Reddick? 
Name me one guy that you'd give a passing grade to. Remember, the entire year and not half the year. Well, Tua got four years, 212. Jalen Carter did not look good down the stretch. He lost the Rookie of the Year award because he fell out of gas, or he ran out of gas, I should say. Okay? Carter fell apart at the end of the year. Fletcher Cox? Okay, Fletcher played, yeah. Fletcher was the best. He's no longer on the team. And by the way, you're right, you, you know, I think Andrew G's right. You all sucked. How you doing, Ken? Appreciate you doing it, brother. Um, so if you ain't first, you're last. Are you are you disputing that? Um, I think Ringo and Rogers needs to start. Boy. There's no chance in hell that's happening with Vic Fangio. Vic Fangio is not going into an NFL season with Keely Ringo and Isaiah Rogers starting a corner in multiple fronts that they haven't ever been in, ever communicated like that. No way. No, unless Slay gets hurt, he is your starter back there. That's the only thing that there's a comforting zone. Remember, he played that Vic Fangio style defense at 22. Vic wants him back. That's. You guys are crazy. This is about knowledge and who's intellectual back there. This is not about ability right now. Why do you think Nolan Smith didn't get on the field last year? Because he wasn't an athlete? No, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. Now, that sounds a little better, Jay Brown. Slay and Rodgers, that sounds better. That sounds a little better. I'd feel comfortable going into a game with that. I'd be all right with that. Now, the one thing with Rodgers, though, is tackling. But then again, they don't want you tackling people back there anymore. So I don't know if tackling is going to be even an issue, but I, I, I don't mind that. That doesn't look awful. Okay, that doesn't look awful. You're going to find out when they play against some competition. Remember something. The intellectual guys in the NFL play. The guys with the most talent don't play. The times that the guys with the great talent start playing is when they start picking up the intellectual part of the game. Dude, I'm telling you, when you get into an NFL huddle, these playbooks are like this. In a college playbook, they're like kind of this. They're a little, okay. But you get four years in the same system and you play behind a guy and you get matriculated into playing and you've got time to develop and practice. They put you in these positions. You pick up the system. When you get to these pro levels and they got these books like this, you're expected to know it now. If you want to play, th these offensive books are like this. They're all on tablets now. They don't, they don't have playbooks, I don't think, like they used to back in the day. And I think the majority of this shit's all on tablet now. Okay. So as you think Mitchell is eventually going to be starting sometime this year? Yeah, you're hoping. I want to get the I want to get the kid in the game as fast as I can. That's going to be up to him. Why do you think the kid's not going to be the opening day starter? You know why? Does he know what he's doing? And if Vic feels comfortable and puts him in there, that's a win for Howie. Absolutely. If Quinion Mitchell starts the opener, that'll be incredible. If he starts him in the slot, they're working him into the secondary. Playing the slot is a lot. Get this. You know why Gardner Johnson is now a slot defensive back? Because he wasn't a good corner. New Orleans thought he was a Decent corner, not a great one. That's why he made 800 grand. That's why he was down on the bottom end of the roster. How he went in there, they dropped him in the slot. Led the NFL in interceptions out of the slot. He didn't lead it out of the cornerback position. He was drafted out of Florida as a corner, not a safety. Remember that. He wasn't drafted. 
He wasn't a very good corner. They moved him. And you know what? Moving from inside to outside, that I've not heard, but I get it. See, that's how I would have done to Kobe Dean. I'd have put him at will, weak side linebacker, worked him into the middle. That's what they did with Seth Joyner. They played him in the weak side and then moved him in and they became the inside Mike Backer. That's how you develop a player. Same with Malcolm Jenkins. I don't think that management will react much to Vic's, Vic Fangio's decisions due to the simple fact that it's on defense and Howie and Jeffrey are offensive-minded people. If Kellen did it, then how and yeah, Mikey, you're not off on that. However, if Bright Stuff can't play and you gave him 18 million bucks, there's going to be some accountability, don't you agree? I mean, dude, get this. John McMullen's trying to tell you with the comments that Vic Fangio made that that was a nothing thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I think that was. And to sit there and say, you think you're really going to turn it around in three weeks by September and turn that guy into some sort of fucking run stopper like Lawrence Taylor, you're out of your tree. That takes time to do. That's going to take a full year. Hey, you don't even know if he could play 900 reps. Let's see him get through 900 reps first. Or 800. Let's see him get through 500 reps. He's never played 500 reps. Now you're going to be asked to play 800. Let's see if he can hold up. He's a little dude. I don't think he has the talent to do what... We want him to do. Twiz. But I think Vic is smart enough to put him in a position to be successful. Okay? I think once they find out his deficiencies, they'll work around him. He's smart enough, to, the DC I'm talking, to work around him. Okay? I think he's smart enough. That's right, Fly. You're going to run a ball right at him. I'm not – hey, one thing I'm not doing – I'm not running the ball early on Jordan Davis or Jalen Carter. You see what those monsters did last year in the first six weeks? Why would I run my face into a wall when I know that they're going to absolutely shut the door on me? I'm going to run at the perimeter. I'm going to run at sweat. You know why I'm going to run at sweat? Eagles don't like him. Either we're going to move him, have gotten cold on him, whatever. Try moving him. Then you got a guy who's got a reputation, and the only person that thinks he can play the run is him. That's important. But look at his tape. I saw it. It's not good. Okay? Change can happen. Jordan Malata proved that. That, that. Are you trying to tell me you think that Bryce Huff is the same talent as Jordan Malata? Jordan Malata never played the sport in his life. This guy's been a pro football player for four or five years. There's a difference. This guy didn't even know how to put shoulder pads on. And now he's the third best tackle in the sport. Really? you got to be kidding me. James goes, I'd take Reddick over Huff. And, Huff, and Reddick has his own issues. Has his own issues against the run. Was not a proficient run stopper. And not very good in dropping back. That's why he didn't want to drop back in coverage. For the record, his pass coverage, too, stuff. I want to see how he does when he's got to cover somebody like a Travis Kelsey. Or that kid in Baltimore in week 12. Shit, the guy in the guy in Washington, or that kid Ferguson in Dallas. Tight ends you got to cover. So Huff's going to – here, let me see this. So here's here's who Huff's got to cover just in tight ends. So he's got to cover Kyle Pitts in the Monday night game against the Falcons. 
I don't know who the Bucks have. Hey, you want to hear something pretty sane, insane about Mike Evans? I didn't realize this. So Mike Evans is going for his 11th straight season of 1,000 yards, and only Jerry Rice has done that? I tell you what, I have underestimated how great a football player Mike Evans is. He's got a Super Bowl championship. He's going for his 11th straight season of 1,000 yards. Incredible. Most underrated wide receiver that has played in the last decade and a half has been Mike Evans. That is unbelievable. I saw that, Prince. Four years, 212. Dolphins relented and gave it to him. Hey, Jay Brown, unbelievable. 11 straight years he's going for. Only Jerry Rice has done that. So he's gone already a decade of 1,000 yards or more in a season. Insane great. Insane. The Browns have a heck of a tight end. Huff will never cover that guy. The Giants don't have a tight end. The Bengals, I don't believe they have a tight end. I think the Jags have a decent one. The Cowboys, Ferguson's getting better and better. The Commanders guy's getting better. I'm not sure about the Rams. Baltimore's got one of the top tight ends in the league. I'm not sure the Panthers, Steelers. Then it goes back to the NFC East as they finish. So you're not going to have to have a lot of matchups and tight ends this year when it comes to Huff having to cover. So you kind of got off the – that Browns game will be tough for them. The Browns one will be. And, and, hey, Loki. Evans is doing it quietly. I, I I cannot believe that he's going for 11th straight years um, of 1,000 yards. Spinbad says, Sills, we need a DE. I think you need more depth there, and you need another defense interior tackle, in my opinion. Dream catcher. Vic Sills, you think Cooper DeGene could potentially be starting week 9 or 10 because of his injury? I don't think he'll start at all this year. He may get some, he may get a starting assignment late in the year, but the best you'll see of Cooper DeGene will be probably in week 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, somewhere down there. Probably, you know, hey, dude, a hamstring injury, which is going to keep you out of reps. You so Vic Fangio, you think is just going to put a guy in there who hasn't practiced or played? Never happened. No D coordinator is right. Mine would. Who do you think he is? Jalen Ramsey? Now, here's the good thing. When you're young, you, you heal quicker. So maybe he'll beat the three. And then you could see him probably in week eight, six, five, in there somewhere, coming out of the bye. Okay, like, listen. If he's if it's two and a half weeks, you could see him coming out of the bye, starting to get more serious reps. I could see that. Dalton Schultz in Houston's a good football player. I really like him. Bengals have Mike Gesick. Okay, well that's that's going to be a pretty tough cover. Okay, that's going to be a pretty tough cover, and that's going to be our weakness covering the tight ends. Absolutely, Matt. Matt. Here's going to be the way to attack Vic Fangio's defense. You're going to motion. Why am I get, if I'm an offense? Okay. How many people in here who who said that they should start Isaiah Rogers and Keely Ringo? Okay. Let's just say I'm Jordan Love and I'm Matt LaFleur. And I already know you're weak at linebacker. Huff can't cover. He can't run. Okay. A narrative on September 6th. These are all narratives. And you're going to go into the game plan. Plus, you're going to take game film out of the last four games that Vic Fangio had in Miami. I've got to take the last four games of Vic Fangio's defense 
in Miami. Then I'm going to look at what Vic Fangio did when he had all of his healthy players for about three or four games and what he's going to try to do. Then I'm going to take the Eagles last three or four games, and I'm going to see what these guys didn't do on why that epic collapse went down, and I'm going to combine it, and I'm going to filter it out, and I'm going to put a game plan on that, and I'm going to ring that out, and I'm going to attack your edge. I'm not going. I don't feel comfortable attacking Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter because when I saw those guys early in the year, they were beating people up, and I think they're going to be healthy and young, and they're going to have energy. That I might not want it. I might test it, but that's not something I'm going to be with 750 pounds worth of man. That that to me looks like a losing proposition in week one. Okay. That's not something I'm going to do. To a science huge deal. See you, Dak. By the way, Sills, you are and should be an inspiration to all the up in the cloud Eagle fans out there. Love the show. Thank you so much, Mikey. I appreciate that, bro. Mikey, I think you had a great week. I really do. Mikey, I think you had a great week, dog. It was really a great week. Okay, but if I'm if I'm if I'm the Packers, Seals, would you move Jalen Carter around the D line? Put him on the weak guard or tackle. Maybe. Do I think he's good enough? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe a little bit. Let's get him acclimated, though. You know, let's get him in there. Let him let him inflict his will on people, and I think he will. But here, if I'm Matt Lafleur, not going to attack him. And Jordan, I'm going to go Huff, Nolan. I don't believe you can set the edge with them two guys. I'm going into that game. My opinion. You are not going to set the edge. Now, if they put sweat, I'm running away from sweat. Okay, I'm running away from sweat. I'll tell you what I would do. I would put Huff behind sweat and get me another edge rusher. That's why you should have had Reddick. Reddick on the other side and Huff behind sweat playing in a traditional 40 front. You can cover some of the deficiencies when it comes to run stopping. Okay, you've turned me from an idiot fan to a realist. Mikey, that's awesome, dude. Mikey, I think you guys do so many great things. Great. 11 goes, why? Because Huff can't play the fucking run. And you've got two guys that are swimps at the perimeter. Setting the edge is essential in playing defense in today's NFL. It's not just about running up the middle. If you get wide on teams and you've got two guys, Nolan Smith has proven nothing. And Huff hasn't either, except that he can get after the quarterback. Other than that, it's who he is. Stop telling me what you want him to be. Thanks, Prince. That's why we run at Micah. Roland, amen. Why do you think the Philadelphia Eagles, every time they see Micah Parsons, they line up and run right at that guy? Because they wear his ass out. Dude, every time Micah Parsons plays against Lane Johnson, it's like there's Velcro on Micah Parsons' jersey. They know his weakness. They run right at him. Why in the world would I run away from him so that he can make athletic plays in pursuit against me or make a play from the backside and hit my quarterback and end my season? I'm going to run right at that fucker because I don't believe he's a physical ball player. I think he's a finesse player. 
I'm going to run right at him. He gets worn down by the end of the year, and he's proven that. Every year he gets worn down. Every year. He's a non-factor from week six on. I think Green Bay beats us, um, sadly, 41-31. Adjustment game. Hey, remember this, though, Jameson. You lose that opening game, and I think you are losing it, too, to the Packers. That's not going to be an indictment on your season. If you do this and you get all your young players on the field and you end up, let's just say, 10-7, and seven, but you're playing the best football that you have played all year long going into December, don't you get it? Think about this, Jameson. You can have a record of 10-7 and seven in December but be playing like a 14-win team. Can you Can you not? Look at Kansas City. They look like an 8-9-win team in the first half of last year with Mahomes. By the end of the year, they look like a 14-win team. They were playing like they were a 14-win team. Okay? Dan's negative. I don't think I've been negative at all today. I don't think you have the defensive guys right now to stop Jordan Love and Matt LaFleur in that opening week. I do not believe that. I I just got through saying, I think you can get better by the end of the year. What negative thing have I said today? One. I say one thing in an hour and 43 minutes, and this guy says that I'm negativity. It's not true. I gave you so many great things that happened this week. Yeah. And Josh Jacobs is on that Packer team. And every time you mention this, Josh Jacobs has had a better career than Barkley. No, he hasn't. Really. You might want that one back too. All right. Okay, Prince. You think they're going to go down there and they're going to beat Green Bay? I don't believe that. Deep, uh, uh, Green Bay's defense isn't great either. I saw them kick the shit out of a team that ran you and boat raced you in the Dallas Cowboys. And they boat raced that Cowboy team. Sills is about that business. Con constructive criticism never hurt anyone unless you're soft. That's right. I talk to you like Vic Fangio talks to his players. Some of you can't take it. Dude, I've been spoken to like this my entire life. From my grandpa to my, there was no gray area in my house. It, it's accountability in my grandpa's house. There's no black or white. It's I mean, there's, there's no gray area. It's black or white. You know, I mean, yin or yang. That's, there's nothing in the middle of my folks. My grandpa raised me. There's nothing. He used to tell me there's nothing in the middle except the hole. There's right and there's wrong. Okay? And you can't dissect right and wrong. You know the difference between right and wrong. The people that dissect it are the ones who are not accountable for their lives. You cannot dissect right and wrong. You just can't. I mean, there's no such thing. Seals, so I think, will be better at making adjustments no matter what. Matt, but that's going to take communication skill set that you don't have right now with the young players back there. I'm not saying they can't pick that up fast, Matt, especially if you're drafting intellectual players and smart players and they're going to be able to comprehend and adjust and they're going to be able to process that information, that's what you're trying to find out right now. I'm telling you, man, the reason Bradbury's on the team, I don't believe the Eagle management want Bradbury on the team. Vic Fangio's telling him, you can't give me a bunch of guys back there who've never communicated one play in an NFL game. You're going to try to tell me that you want to play Cooper DeGene and you want to play Quinion Mitchell in the same backfield. That's disastrous. Until they play, until they matriculate their game. Do you see what they can do? Strengths and weaknesses. Do you find out? Sitting there basing it on a, a 
a combine or what they did in college is ridiculous. Cooper DeGene at Iowa and Quinion Mitchell at Toledo, it stopped on draft night. Stop talking to me about college. It has nothing to do with the Green Bay game. Nothing. Here, they played in zone defenses in college. Okay, they have an understanding of what Vic's structure and scheme is. Perfect. That's why you drafted them. You don't get slapped on the back for finding skill set guys that fit the coordinator scheme. That's why you draft people like that. But until you put them on the field, sitting here on July 26 and telling me, hey, let's put DeGene and Mitchell on the backfield with Keely Ringo on the other. I'll, Matt LaFleur will have a field day with that. And you go, Sills, wait a minute. Kansas City did that. Kansas City had Mahomes. You don't have Mahomes. You don't have a quarterback that can control a clock, throw you out of problems. You don't have that guy. Do you have to understand something that Mahomes gives you that no quarterback in the league gives you? It doesn't matter what the roster looks like. Mahomes is going to keep you in a ball game whether you have talent on the team or you don't. He's going to win Super Bowls. Dude, that guy is more accountable. You can't pay that guy enough money on what his value is. You think Vic and Howie get along? I do. Right now, July 26th? Yes. Let me tell you one more, one more thing about that comment about Mahomes. They take talent off that roster every year. And the production and the winning doesn't stop. His production is more spread out now. He's a better quarterback since Tyree Kill left. Plus, you have two since, say, hey, how much do you think Patrick Mahomes in practice benefits from Steve Spagnola being the coordinator on the other side? How much do you think Brady benefited having Belichick on the other side in practice every Monday through Saturday? You think that played a factor in their development? That you had some of the greatest defensive minds of all time? You don't think Jalen Hurts is going to get better seeing multiple disguise coverages and multiple coverages with Vic Fangio, and that's going to make him better? I do. I completely do. I mean, you think Hurts benefits with Fangio? On the, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely I do. I, I, without a question, I completely do. Okay? Vic is more creative version of Gannon. That sounds right, R Roland. I like that. I, 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 liked, I like that take. I do. I like that take. Um, what that is what San Francisco will have to face in the near future, losing talent. Yeah, and get this. Here's what will happen, picking. Hey, Niner all day. I hate to do this to you, but here's what's gonna happen. Brock Purdy is gonna turn into Russell Wilson. And here's why. Once you start taking players off that team after you pay him at the end of this year, if they get back to another Super Bowl, and let's say they win it, and you start taking players off that roster because you got to pay him $65 million, he will be a worse version of Russell Wilson because he can't throw you out of trouble. He's a better version of Jimmy Garoppolo. And you'll be stuck with that salary and you'll have a Derek Carr situation on your hands and you'll move off him. Two years after they give that money to him and you start exiting players off that team, he'll revert into being Jimmy Garoppolo. Okay? So, Sills, you're telling me Mahomes wins a Super Bowl without Kelsey? Um, yeah. Yeah. So you think that tied in? That's like telling me Brady doesn't win Super Bowls without Gronk. It's not true. I actually think Mahomes is more talented than Brady. 
Oh, I see. Brady's the only one that wins games by himself. Okay? He didn't have Gronk his entire time. I think Gronk won what? Three of them six up there with him? He had Ben Coates and the murderer that he won the other three with. What's your point? Oh, I see. Mahomes can't. Okay. They get another tight end in there. Andy Reid is notorious for finding tight ends. He did it in Philly. You think there's any coincidence there's a tight end in Kansas City like there was a tight end in Philly when he was there and no wide receivers? Andy Reid has built a personnel offense around Patrick Mahomes the same way he built it around McNabb. No receivers, tight end. And a, and a back that's efficient like a Westbrook or Pacheco. Are you blind? It's the same setup. It's it's the same setup. As a former player, can you speak to how Vic sees something in Bradford or Bradbury, excuse me, that we can't in order for us to win games? Here, Dave, think about this, Dave. The reason he's on the team is because of his knowledge. Okay. He knows more than Ringo. He knows more than Mitchell. He knows multiple disguise coverage coverages that Vic runs. He knows complex defenses. He's not the better player anymore. That's not what I'm saying. Better player doesn't always play. The more knowledgeable player plays. That was the key in New England. Look at all those no-name guys that they had on offense or defensive guys that you didn't even know who the hell they were. Chris Hogan's of the world, finding the Wes Welkers or the Edelman's. Um, Amendola's all these guys wasn't because those guys were better than Reggie Wayne who tried to play up there or Chad Oak Josenko tried playing up there why couldn't those guys play they didn't understand what was being asked of them and their complex offense and Josh McDaniel's offense so they never played and were never factors did you ever wonder why Reggie Wayne went up there and said these guys practiced their ass off and I could not pick up their offense and Reggie Wayne's on the cusp of going to the Hall of Fame. Okay. That's why. So were you trying to tell me Amadola and Edelman are better than Ocho Cinco and uh, Reggie Wayne? Of course they're not. But they knew where to line up. That's why Bradbury's on your football team. That's why he is in the position he's in. That experience is valuable, I see. That's right. It's the only reason he's on the roster is because Vic doesn't want to go in with all the – get this, if you took Bradbury out, who's the most experienced guy you have in your secondary? Let's take Slay out of the conversation. Take Slay out of the conversation, and if you cut Bradbury today, who would be your most experienced DB? Heading into the Green Bay game. Okay. Avante Maddox? Mr. Paper Mache himself? Isaiah Rogers? Coming off a year that he didn't play? I thought he went up there. I thought I thought Reggie went up there. Let me take a look at that. Reggie Wayne stats. No, Reggie Wayne. Maybe it was Houston. <clears throat> I could have swore he went to New England. Want to be double sure here. Let me see here. Yeah, Patriots, 15, practice squad. He was in New England. Couldn't make the team. Couldn't make the team. Couldn't pick up the offense. I mean, that's – see, and I, and I heard John go. I, it was such a brilliant take by John. John goes like this. I don't think the Eagle management wants James Bradbury on this team. 
Okay. Vic does, though. Um, yeah, that's right, Flexen, because he couldn't make the team. Let's see here. Maddox will be her. I, 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 I'm, I'm not hoping for that. Let's, let's, let's see what happens. Overpaid for Tua. Hey, Flexen. Thoughts on Tua's new contract? So overpaid at two hundred and twelve. What does that come out to? What is that a year? Let's see how much is that? Is that fifty six? Is that what that comes out to? Two? What is it? Two fourteen? Two twelve? Fifty three. They paid him two million less than Lawrence and Burrow. Paid him two more million than Hertz. Paying him two more million than or two more million than Lamar. It's four years too with a guy who's injury prone. Man, it's a lot of money. But what's the alternative? Trading for Dak? Flexing goes, he's garbage. He led the NFL in passing yards last year. Threw for 4,600 yards. Not garbage. This guy had 4,600 passing yards. I mean, he led the National Football League in total yardage as a passer from the pocket last year. How's that garbage? Your guy can't throw for over 3,800 yards. I mean, honestly, this guy throws for like eight, nine hundred yards more a year than what you're almost a thousand yards more than what your guy does every year. Like, be that's right, be real. This guy's a good player. I mean, right, Andrew, this guy threw for almost five thousand yards and he's garbage, and your guy's never thrown for four grand and you gave him 50. Look, look at Jeffrey, look at his weapons. Look at your quarterback's weapons, and he can't get over 3,800 yards. No shit. Look at his weapons. He utilizes them. He uses them to his benefit, too. Right. Okay. Well, what did I tell – hey, one more time. What did I tell you about quarterbacks and players in today's NFL? You don't get paid – the only person that's been ever paid on making it to a Super Bowl has been Jalen Hurts. The rest of these players and these quarterbacks are getting paid on the numbers they put up. Not what they did as a team. Jalen is the only guy. That's why he's not proficient in his numbers. Hurts is never going to be a big number guy. 